Well, good morning. Welcome to Southside Bible Church. Grateful to have any visitors. We are always glad to have brothers and sisters who come and worship God with us. So I hope you feel a special welcome while you're here with us. I uh, wanted to encourage you guys with something beautiful that I see happening in our midst. When we began Romans, one of, one of my prayers, what are you doing, man? Oh, <clears throat> I'm very aware of my surroundings. You looked a little suspicious, Wayne. So one of my prayers was in Romans 1.14 that Paul says, I'm a debtor to all men. Because of the grace that he received, I, I owe a debt to tell all men when about the rescue that there is in Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, it owns me. And therefore, he said, I'm eager to come preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. And I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And so my prayer was that as we would behold this and grow in understanding it, that our evangelism in our own hearts would, would grow and it would deepen, that it, it, it would just I don't know, go forth. And we taught Sunday school of a call to mission where we began meeting to learn more effectively how to share the gospel and pray together as a, as a community for those that need Jesus Christ. And so I want us to continue to grow in that in our community groups that we get together and we, we pray for these souls. And what I've been seeing in, in just different meetings and journeying this body has been so rich. One of our MTP guys, uh, DJ, was stationed in Qatar, and he goes and he goes to a Bible study in Romans, and there's everything from A to Z, unbelievers, believers, and uh, they asked him to take over Romans and start teaching it. So he's now in this, this place bringing the gospel week in and week out. Um, I met with a couple, and they their, their chiropractor that they go to, all, they have these special things that they do with all their patients and they get together and they are now these evangelists just going to everything they can and loving and sharing the gospel. I had a brother who was asked to preach his grandfather's memorial service and the gospel was just presented so beautifully. He gave me a, a recording of it and uh, unbelievable, just the clarity of the gospel and the, the angle and the way he brought it. I bumped into a brother in the bathroom last week. Uh, he was in a funeral and he just shared about all the evangelism that he had at this reception. Talked to a lady this week who's a, a hospice nurse just spreading the gospel from patient to patient. A gentleman who yesterday, Friday, who owns his own business and shared why he wants to stay in business. It's just the, the evangelism is exploding for him, we have a gal who showed up who got saved and just a hard rock singer, and she's writing lyrics now with the Jesus Christ to tell people all over the world in that realm about Jesus Christ. And then, as you just heard, uh, this choir, um, praise God, um, they are going to put together a, a Christmas uh, event. So I don't, what, what do you call it, Ken? A Christmas choir? <laughs> Is that the right word? I don't want to blow this. Okay. And so what I love is we're going to go and invite neighbors and everything, and it's going to have singing and uh, even a little children's choir so that I want you to go evangelize grandparents. They'll come to anything and just get every unbelieving uncle, aunt, and bring them. And then there's going to be a 10-minute gospel, and, and my conscience was struck. They asked me to put on a Santa suit, and I said, nope. It, it, it's not going to happen. But So be praying for that. If you want to sing in the choir, uh, come forth and see Ken who just led that. Um, he's, he's bringing people in. And so if you have a heart for that. So I just, as a church, just to, just to go out and invite and bring uh, people in. We're going to do it on a Friday night. And so just story after story of the gospel filling our hearts and you're getting out and you're loving people with the message of salvation. And so I just pray, keep praying and sharing the truth, and may God bring many into the kingdom of light of his glorious Son. And so again, the gospel is not the family secret. It's to be proclaimed and shared and told in a world that is so needy of this gospel. So I pray that it just keeps awakening our hearts to go forth and proclaim it.
So turn with me. Uh, what would you say about Santa? Who said that? <laughs> We're going to Romans 14 now. You ready? I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you about Santa. <laughs> <clears throat> so go with me to Romans 14. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. This will be part 2. Uh, from last time we were together. And so this is the Word of God, and I want you to tremble that the God of this universe has recorded His thoughts for us. Uh, Don't come to this with low thoughts or average thoughts. These are the words of our God. Romans 14, 1. Now accept the one who's weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinion. One person has faith that he can eat all things. That's me. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does not, does it so for the Lord. And he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not does it for the Lord that he does not eat. And he gives thanks to God. For not one of us (coughs) lives for himself and not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Father, I pray now that you will take these words and you will open up our minds, that we would understand them and therefore our hearts uh, would, would respond to what you want to teach us. Lord, such an important subject and topic in the body of Christ such an important day-to-day working out of our salvation. God, I pray that you would move in our midst and that we would understand what these words mean and that we would be obedient to them. God, that we would live these out for your name's sake. So meet us here now in a mighty way, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. (laughs) So we have this outline that we're following through these verses. The verse one is this general principle to accept uh, the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on him. And so there were some issues that are beginning to cause division and strife in the body of Christ. And and so what we're asking is, what were those issues? What was hurting a, a church that could have the foundation that we've been studying in Romans of the gospel? Well, it was what we call Christian liberty, There are these areas where there's not clear commandments that are being taught on these issues. They're not regulated by commands. They're what we call then our freedoms in Christ. And they're the working out of our faith in day-to-day life and in areas like whether you eat meat or vegetables only whether you drink wine or not, whether every day is is alike or there are special days in the Christian life. And so we have called these non-essential issues. They're they're not issues that, that we have to confront and lead you to repentance like if it was a commandment, which we're called to do as brothers and sisters. <laughs> they're very important for the body of Christ. So I, when we say non-essential, I don't want you to think they're not important. These are very important. That's why Paul is spending so much time on them. But what, what were they doing in Rome? Well, it says in verse 3 that they're judging one another. They're, they're, they're looking down on someone who, who uh, can't eat meat they're, or someone who is eating meat. They're judging them. And then the others who are eating meat are looking down going, those poor people, they just don't know freedom. They're just stuck. And it's breaking their unity as a church. And so this is really important to God and Paul that more time spent on this subject than any other subject in Romans. So it's, it's very important. Um, what are they doing then? Uh, one is weak in faith, Paul says, and one is strong in faith. So there, what I want you to see that we looked at last time is they were believers. They're looking to Christ alone for their salvation. 
And so it's not weak in justification in coming to Jesus. It's weak now in the outworking as believers of what can I do with conscience in these areas, these Christian liberties. One is a little weaker in the trajectory of how their faith gets worked out, and one is a little stronger in their understanding of how we work these things out. <clears throat> but what is the driving issue of Paul's heart then? As he looks out and the strong and weak are struggling over these things, what, what is Paul concerned about? What is the focus of this chapter? And I don't want you to miss it. In verse 1, it's accept the one who's weak in faith. Verse 3, to receive one another. So I, I, I'm, I'm wanting you with all of these differences in the body of Christ I want you to receive one another. And what I love going on here is God's bringing people from A to Z. It's just we're all different walks of life, different cultures, different upbringings, blue collars, white collars. It's beautiful. And now when you come together, this is going to become more and more important of how I don't judge and look down and receive each other with all of our differences because we have this thing in common of faith in Jesus Christ and, and looking to his coming and return. So what unites us is unbelievable. And what we differ on, uh, he's teaching us how we can stay so united. Are you receiving one another? Not a people, and now we're the people of God. And so we receive each other. This is big. I spent a lot of time examining my heart, repenting, seeking grace to be as open as God is to every believer in this place. I want to be as open to you as God is. And He brings you all the way in, all the way to His very heart, His throne room, into the kingdom of God. He brings you in, every one of you who have faith in Jesus Christ. I love it. Different is how we grow. It's the bedrock of how we work this out. In marriage, one thing you learn quickly is God always joins together like different. And you're, you're different in so many ways because if you're just the same, you will. And I have people say, I'm leaving my spouse because we're so different. And in Genesis 2, God says, I made you like different. Of course you're different. God decreed that. He brought it so that those differences would make you more like Jesus Christ. And now you come into a body and we are all like different. And we have different things and where we're from. And this is how we're going to grow as we receive one another with these differences. I just feel like I should preach that again. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm going to use self-control, John. and I'm going to just keep moving. So here's what hits me. This must be hard to do, Right? Because Paul's going to take so much time on this subject. It's, you know, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I start to realize I think there's something here that's difficult and hard. That's why he's going to keep going through this. But what blows me away is Paul's going to pull out the biggest canons that we have in Christianity as he opens this up. And I think this is what separates us from the world and everyone else is Paul's going to say, be different, be unified in the essentials of Christianity and have really strong convictions on Christian liberty and receive one another with those differences. This happens nowhere in the world. This is beautiful. But praise be to God, it happens here on a daily basis and you're growing in it. The joy of your pastors. And you need to know that all hell is set against this kind of loving and living because it points to Jesus Christ alone, because you can't find this unity anywhere. And so that's what's at stake here with our unity. And so our outline is that that's the general principle. Verse two, then Paul now brings the first example. And in verse two, he says, one man has faith that he can eat all things. And the other is he, he's weak in his faith and he eats vegetables only. 
Let's look at it. Um, I think we... Never mind, my brain's going blank. Um, So that was coming and looking. We saw that meat was sacrificed to idols and it was, you know, worshipped. And then sometimes then they would sell it in the market and they had to decide. Uh, Some things are talking about what was clean and unclean to the Jewish person, what was kosher. And so now there's meats that that weren't and, and just we'd go to vegetables. And so there are a lot of different debates as to what it was. But the, the issue was, is there's someone who has faith that all I can do is eat meat and someone else says I can only eat vegetables. And now Paul's going to charge that issue that we looked at last time and then we'll move on. In verse 3, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. And so he wants us to, to not judge one another in these differences. And someone then who, who's eating meat, he doesn't want us to judge him and say, man, they're, they're so immature. They're not holy like me. Uh, and I wonder if they're Christians and you're, you're judging them. And then on the other side, as we talked about, the ones who are eating meat are looking out going, man, they just don't know their liberty. They poor, All he can eat is vegetables. Doesn't he know what a Big Mac could do for his digestive system? <laughs> <coughs> Who said that? What's your cholesterol numbers? <laughs> so verse 4, this, this just drives it home then. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. And so just remember, it's not, you're not their master. God is. And that's the one that we're all worried about. It's to him that I make all these decisions And what has helped me the most is you don't need all my holy decisions to stand on these issues. And so God's going to be able to make you stand and stand you will that that God brings his people to the end. You will not fall. You will not lose your faith. You will not leave Jesus if you are a child of God. And so that is the freedom that we can have is I I usually hear, I just think they're not going to make it to the end if they don't have my convictions. And to just finally be free that they have God, and that's who they're going to give an account to, not you. So on the last day of judgment, you won't be there, but they're going to stand before God, and you can, you can just lovingly give your brothers and sisters to God in these issues. And so what, I, I don't have to make them all think and act and be like me. Doesn't that take some pressure off? And, and, then, you, and then if you take the pressure off, it's, it's not like I, I'm not my brother's keeper. I, I, I give you to God. So I don't even have to worry about it ever again because you have someone watching over you who's going to make you stand and I just feel so safe giving you to God in these areas. Now we come to verse 5. He's going to pull out a second example and that's where we left off. <clears throat> one person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. So it's, it's on the one hand, one man regards a, a, a one day above another, and day on the other hand, one man regards every day alike. It seems that the church of Rome now is struggling over days, and one day seems to be more holy than another day. And, and just going to pull out some other verses to show you that Paul mentions this in other places. Galatians 4.10, he says, you observe days in the plural and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. And that's because they're looking back to their keeping of holy days to get justified. And if you look for that to be your salvation, he's like, I think I've labored over you in vain. There's a foolishness. And so that's not what's going on here. But Colossians 2.16 might nail what's going on here. Therefore, Let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Don't don't let anyone be your judge on these issues. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And so here is our context. Uh, we're, We're not doing it as a way to get to heaven, but they're all doing it as a way to please God. So I want to make sure we don't lose sight of that. And so one note is that in verse 5, he drops the weak and the strong. He doesn't even mention it. So it's no longer who's weak or who's strong, but it's, it's, it's less of a mature understanding uh, how we work out with days that are holy. 
<clears throat> so here are some possibilities of what I think Paul is talking about. I think I'm leaning towards a Sabbath. And what we have in America today is we have um, the Sabbath was on, on a Saturday. It was the, the, the seventh day. And so you have the seventh day Adventists, and they will only gather on Saturday. <clears throat> then we move in where we say now the Sabbath is on Sunday. <clears throat> Most likely, the apostles in the early church are rec recorded as gathering today together on the first day of the week when Christ was raised from the dead. And so all of a sudden now they would, they would meet on Sunday. And it was a day that was to be taken up with worship, to cease from work, to cease from entertainment and recreation. Uh, the exception was the duties of necessity and mercy of some of the things that Jesus taught. And so we just kind of moved the Sabbath over to Sunday because that's when Jesus was raised. And there are some people sitting in here this morning who hold to that. Then there's also another view, and all these views are generic. There's a lot of different thought. So I'm just throwing out principles. And this would be the Lord's Day. <clears throat> and this is the Sabbath was for the Jews when they gave the Old Testament. And they had a Sabbath day. And, and it's mostly an unbelieving nation, and I, I think they needed a command to worship God. But what, what I see is that in the, Christ came and he fulfilled the law. We saw that in Romans 13, 8 through 10. And in Hebrews 4, he now says there's a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And he says, and if, if it was what Joshua did when he brought him into the Canaan, it wouldn't speak of a, of a future rest. And so the rest was when, you know, moves to the seventh day that God rested on the seventh day. And it wasn't because he was tired. He was finished. And he says, in the same way, Jesus hung on a cross and he said, die." It's finished, and the one who ceases from his works enters into his Shabbat, his rest. And so now we would see that this rest is, I keep the Sabbath 24-7 because I've ceased from my works and I look to Jesus Christ alone for my rest. And, and so another possibility, so no day is more holy than the other, but we gather on the Lord's day, the day he was resurrected to worship. So what I want you to see is there's three views. And, and, and Paul's saying, I don't want you dividing up the church over those things. Those, those aren't going to be essentials. It could be special days, special feasts, special Sabbaths. And that's what's going on in the church. So whatever it's talking about, Paul says, I want you to be convinced in your own mind, and I want you to do it for the Lord. And so as we move on, I'm just going to try to give some modern day applications so you might be able to pull it in, is, is just the Sabbath. I had a guy when, when I pastored another church, who he came over from a Reformed church, and his church, church disciplined him because he came to our church and we said he could watch the Broncos on Sunday. And they held to a Sabbath. And, and on the Sabbath, you're not to go to the Bronco game. And so they're, they're holding that, and, and so they say, you're in sin, and they call him to repentance, and, and he's church disciplined for that. What do we do with that here? What do we do with Christmas? There's strong views on whether we celebrate it, we don't, how we do it. There's strong views on Good Friday and Easter. It has some pagan background. There's Christ Mass for Christmas. There's all these things that are tied in what the world has done and turned it into hedonism. And so there's things you got to work out. And, and uh, the other is we don't know the exact date. So I, I have people that don't like December 25th because that's probably not when he was born. All days are equal. Nothing's wrong. Is it wrong to stop as a church and focus on the incarnation? All these things start coming in and they divide up churches. That's why Paul's addressing this. But before I go on, I want to ask you one question. How would you respond to someone who doesn't celebrate Christmas with a conviction from his own conscience or hers that they're doing it for the Lord? You look down on them? Man, that poor guy can't even enjoy Christmas. <laughs> How do you feel about someone who does and they got a good reason for why they do it and they worship Jesus and they focus on the incarnation and positive things come out of it? How do you deal with someone like that? So that's bigger to Paul. I want you to hear this. Those are big issues. And Paul's saying, receive one another. 
Love one another with those differences. This is not to be the dividing point in churches. I had a guy who came and they, they split a church over Christmas, whether you should celebrate it or not. I pray that would never happen. Should you celebrate these special days or not? Is it wrong to have convictions on them? What is the important thing to God? And that's what I want to work through as a church right now, is our mind and our motives. And so as we move into this now, a few foundations need to be set, I believe, to fully get it. And I love how Paul does this. Now we're going to learn about how the conscience works on these issues. So we, we've looked at what the issues are, and now Paul's going to move in that you're, you're, these are conscience issues. How does the conscience work? And I want to make sure that we all understand the conscience before we start unfolding this argument or you won't follow it. And so this isn't exhaustive. It's just a few points from the book that we went over in Sunday school uh, on the conscience by Nacelli and Crowley. And I'm just pulling out a few thoughts from that. The conscience is a human capacity. Everyone in this room by creation has one. So when you sit and say, I, I don't have one, you do. You might sear it, but every human has a conscience. And it's this capacity that God has put within us in our makeup for moral judgment. And the conscience reflects the moral aspect of God's image in us. And so the creature uh, can make moral judgments. That's, we're separate from the rest of creation. The conscience is shining the spotlight, he said, of your moral judgment back on yourself. So you have this ability to make moral judgment, and the conscience puts the spotlight on you, your thoughts, and your actions. It's a priceless gift from God. And the conscience, it could say guilt, you're in sin, and it's, it's preaching guilt to you. Or it could say joy, you're walking in God's commands. And it, it brings peace when you do that. And so it has an on-off switch. It's not a dimmer. It's about right and wrong. It's about black and white. It doesn't do gray very well at all. And so it either comes and accuses you, or it excuses you. And so I can't tell you how important it is to train this conscience by God's word. Because the, the, the more truth that goes in, the more efficient and effective your conscience will work. It, it, it only works to the degree that it's informed. And so it works to what you know and believe to be true. And so as we fill it with the word of God, it's going to work more and more effective in your life. And so I want you to get this, though. One point, it's only for you. It was given for you, not for someone else. There's freedom. Others' consciences belong to them, not you. God gave them to them. And you can't force others to adopt your conscious standards or you will hurt them. If you get them to just follow whatever your great standards are and they don't fill it with truth and move there rightly, you're, you're damaging people's souls. You think you're helping them, but you're actually hurting them if you convince them to go against their conscience. And so just hear this. No two people have the exact same conscience. No two people. No one's conscience perfectly matches the will of God till you die. So I just want you to realize that your conscience is going to keep growing and being informed as you grow in Christ. Informing it through God's will, his word, experience in the body. I learned so much about my conscience by living with you folks and by the Spirit of God. And so I want you to realize that you can damage your con conscience. You can make it too sensitive on things, and you can make it insensitive on other things. You can ignore it, and you can actually sear your conscience where it doesn't even work. And so there are two great principles in Romans 14 that God is the Lord of conscience and we're to obey our conscience. And so this man, uh, these two men in this book wrote a definition that I liked on the conscience. The conscience is, and I like it in capital letters, is your, your consciousness of what you believe is right or wrong. And so it's your consciousness of what you believe is right or wrong based on the truth that you're learning in God's word, and it's going to accuse or excuse you. So now let's move into what Paul is going to direct us to act with these different consciences in the body of Christ on Christian liberty. So how do, we got these consciences that he gave us. 
How do we now move into the body of Christ where we differ and, and, and dwell together in unity? So let's just start looking at it at the mind first. <clears throat> Verse 5. One person, one man regards one day above another, and another uh, regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. So one man, one person regards one day above another. This Greek word for regards, it means to judge, to think about, and to arrive at a conclusion. So this is calling you to think in truth and to come to your own conclusions on these kind of issues. And so one thing that I'm going to really push you is what I don't like is when you give no thought to it. I just do whatever I feel. That's the worst thing you can do. And so we need to think out our lives and how we live them before God and get truth in there and make these conclusions in our own hearts. And Paul says, let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. He, he wants you to get a conviction. He, he wants you to think this stuff out and be convinced. And so it's an imperative. It's a command. It's in the present tense. I think that's important. It's not a one-time decision. You're growing in these things. I, I pray if you have never changed a conscience conviction, something's wrong. You should be moving and growing and learning and discerning. And, and, and if you just hold to all the same things that your parents handed down to you, more than likely you're a legalist. Present tense, be fully convinced and be sure that your conduct is in accord with the will of God. Romans 12, 2, to, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what the will of God is. You need to be learning truth, renewing your mind, and each of us need to come to our own judgment on these issues before God, and now it's our conscience, and we obey it, and we follow those convictions. And so I want you to hear this. This is a call for conviction. Each person, let it be your own. Become yours. Each one of us has a responsibility to search these things out for ourselves. <clears throat> Paul wants us to logic them out and think about them, and he's going to help us do that now. And I think it's wrong to just say, hey, this is the way I've always done it. This is the way Baptists have done it for 100 years. This is the way my father did it. You need to be convinced from your own study, your own prayer, your own counselors. I, I, this is so big. And, and in parenting that we're training and shepherding our children to learn how to do this instead of just follow everything dad says. I want, I want to train you for how to live before the eye of God and it be your own walk and it be your own convictions and not run around the rest of your life saying, this is what my dad did. Throw it out, Kelsey. <laughs> I wholeheartedly believe it's wrong and damaging in the long run for me to tell you what your convictions on these areas should be. This is the way that God sanctifies his people. And, and what do churches like to focus on? These issues and tell you how to do it all and make sure we all agree on them. That's the worst thing you can do for the body of Christ. So I want to teach you how to think and how to come to your, you hear this, your own convictions. I don't want Pharisees of just telling you, here's what you should think and do. God loves us too much to make us cookie cutter Christians who all think and act and do the same thing. But I'm going to die preaching Jesus Christ and his lordship and that you're to grow in the knowledge and the grace of him and your decisions will come from a true walk and a true communion with Christ. These conscience issues come from a walk with Jesus Christ his lordship in your life. If you don't want to please him in all that you do, this, this, just quit listening. You're just going to hurt everybody and stomp on everybody with your convictions. These are people who've been born again that say, Jesus, I want to please you with every one of these convictions that I live by in my life. You must know your master and what he wants from you to serve him best. And so one note, and we'll go on, is, is that the church has to make certain decisions on conscience issues. So I want you to know that is I'm not trying to bind your conscience, but I, I've, I, I, drums you know, can mess with people. And, and it's hard. And you're, you're, as, as elders, you're looking and saying, what, what is like 
the norm of the church. Where, where are people at? And we're trying to find this spot in, in the worship. And so I just want you to know that if you love drums and you're like, why don't you get those big cages where they beat them and they make noise? And, and, and others are going, I'll, I'll die if you do that. I'll leave. And, and all of a sudden, drums are, are going to be bigger than Jesus Christ. But I just want you to hear it. We have to make decisions on those things. We got to make decisions. What are we going to do with Christmas at Southside Bible Church? It's a conscience. So how, how are we going to help this church the best to, to journey them in that? And I'm not, I'm not ever stood up here one time and said, you have to celebrate Christmas or you don't. But every year I get up and preach the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And, and we look at him and we worship and we stare. And if we don't agree on that, we got big problems. Amen. So does that make sense? We, got, we have to make conscience decisions as we lead the body of Christ. A husband has to do it for his home. I I'm going to run out of time. I had a great question last week of a wife saying, what if my conscience is different than my husband's? Um, I'll answer that next week. <laughs> but but I, yeah, no, I, I think I got enough time to at least try the, the law of Christ. And what should start happening in a marriage is I care about your conscience. I care about you. How do we work together and, and try to love each other with these differences and, and journey? And, and it might be you finally just have to make a decision with the differences, but make it out of love versus harshness not caring about the other person's conscience. And so young ladies, be very careful who you marry because they're going to make the final decision in your home on some conscience issues. And if they don't, aren't tender and kind and loving, you're going to get hurt really bad. Be careful who you marry. Okay, that's for free. Man, I'm fired up. So the key here is your mind has truth that informs your conscience. And we must always obey our conscience. Remember, the conscience is not infallible. We keep studying and growing, but Paul's saying you need to follow your conscience. You need to be persuaded in your own mind, so it is important what you approve and disapprove. So you got to work at it. And now he's going to bring it into how do I guide it? Get ready for this. The motive in verses 6 through 9. <clears throat> Verse 6, he who observes the day observes it for the Lord. He who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he does not eat for the Lord. He does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. What jumped out at you in that section? It's repeated three times. For the Lord. I, I don't know how you can say it any clearer. This is your controlling consideration now as we move into conscience, not what do I like. What controls your decisions? For the Lord. For the Lord. For the Lord. For his glory. Is it pleasing unto Christ, my Lord? So Paul is saying that neither practice is sinful if your motivation is right. I want you to get that. You can have differences on this, and if your motivation is right, you're both right. To God be the glory. And you don't have to change people if their motivation is right. If their motivation is wrong, we got to lead them to the right motivation. That's the body of Christ. The right motivation. If we desire to do it to the honor of the Lord, do you, do you see what you're shooting at? How are we to live? The great burden of our hearts for each other. Is this why you do what you do? As a pastor, that sits on me. Why do you do what you do? And I want it to be for the Lord. Help each other with this. I just don't want you to see it my way. I want you to see it his way. This is where we can help each other the most. Write down 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 31. They're working through these conscience issues and his conclusion is, well, whether then you eat or you drink, whatever you do, do all of the glory of God. Whatever you do on these conscience issues, do it for the glory of God. See, this quickly shows if you've been born again because you just like laws and rules and the born again believer says, I just want Christ. I want to please him. And so this is just like water to a man in the desert going, yeah, preach. That's what it must be. And so this, uh, this is what we said as a theological mountain out of an ethical molehill. As we saw in Romans that we're born and we're wired all wrong. So if you've just walked in here for the first time, we come into this world broken. 
Everything's been broken since Adam sinned in the fall. And now we come in and we should make much about God. We should worship him. He should be everything to us. And we come into the world with something else in the place of God. Me. And that's what's killing you here this morning is that you're at the center of your life and you want to be worshiped and no one else will do it. And you're frustrated and you're struggling. That's what the fall has done. We now live for our glory. All we want is approval, applause, clapping, people to notice me. That's what the fall has done. We want our glory. And then God comes in and saves you. And he gives you a new heart that wants his glory. He he makes you right. He brings you back to your senses. He makes you sane. You're at the feet of Jesus in your right mind now. I just want him. He's everything. I want him worshiped. And our passion now is how do I please him? How do I please him? And too often, conscience issues are what pleases me. And I want you to rise out of that this morning and just say, it's for the glory of God. That's what it is. All of our life is now lived unto him who bought me for himself. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home from the body or absent, to be pleasing to him. He's our all in all. Paul just strips the issues away of who is right. Don't you feel embarrassed to even say who's right now? If you, ha- if you celebrate a Sabbath, do it to the Lord. If you don't eat meat, do it to the Lord. If you drink wine, do it for the Lord. What drives all that I do is just a passion to please God. And this is growing in the Christian life because I want to keep teaching you. You say, well, how does that work? It, you're going to just, everything's going to be unto God now and it's a joy. We get to love others. So we get to, Love God and love others is the answer to this whole thing. Does it sound like the law of Christ? He's just fleshing out, this is the law of Christ. In these areas, I get to love God and I get to love other other people. Romans 1, the condemnation of humanity as creation showed that there was a God, his invisible attributes, his divine power were clearly seen. And it says that they suppressed him and they wouldn't give him thanks or glorify him as God. And now in this text, he's going to say, give thanks and glorify God. That's what he's done in our hearts. We need to stop and ask ourselves this hard question. Is my liberty the issue? I can have a glass of wine if I want. I I like fashion. That's all that really matters. I I like Christmas because I get a bunch of presents. Honestly, I, I, I just like meat. I love steak. Dancing's fun just never goes any higher than that. And Paul says, you're wrong. You're wrong. Your goal is the glory of God in all of these things. Is that why I do what I do? Or is it just for me and my pleasures? Is this the grid that you run your life through? This is going to mess with you. What is your grid? Is it God or yourself? What are you living for? Because this is the plumb line to hold all of our liberties, our Christian liberties. James says you look into the perfect law of liberty. You stare into Jesus Christ and it's liberty now to live, to love him and love others. That is the most freeing thing. Like I couldn't command a believer to anything else that would be sweeter or better. Go love God and love others. And your heart says, yes, yes. And if you do, who are... Who are you to look down on others? <laughs> Who are you to judge with what God is pleased? So they're doing it by faith. And Paul's going to close this section out and say, if it's not a faith, it's sin. If you're not doing it by faith, it's sin. Verse 6, let me summarize it. I'm, I'm, I'm going off my notes too much. You guys are going to get mad at me. I got I to gotta move on. Sorry. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. You know how that would change your life if that's what you did with your conscience issues and these freedoms in these areas. That's for free. Sometimes I think we like the little things called Christian freedom. And that's all, I, if someone followed you around and they just said, that's all you're about. That's all you talk about. And, and I've seen it. Some people come in here and all you talk about is your religious freedoms and, and that's what floats your boat. 
And I want you to look at something else. The big things are what are to take your heart away. Romans 1 through 13 are to take your heart away. And the big things of the gospel are to take your heart up and what you love and what you focus on. Just sets Romans 14 in the perfect setting of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now I can enter in and love the law of Christ. So Paul's going to elaborate in verses 7 through 9. Verse 7, this is interesting. He says, if we live, it's for the Lord. And if we die, it's for the Lord. And this is what jumped out at me. We're just talking about whether you eat meat or not. (laughs) Lighten up, Paul. We're talking about meat. And he's talking about living and dying. You, you think I overdo it? Just, doesn't it seem extreme? He, he wants you to get extreme with this. Your life, all these things, meat, drink, days, they're big because they're for him. Death, they're, they're all going to be gone. And you're just left. What would you do with your days? What, what's the answer to life and death and all these things? It's just him. We live to him. We're governed by our relationship to him. Not one of us lives or dies for our own self. We're to live and die entirely for the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. We die for him. Meaning we don't decide how, when, or where we're going to die. We're not in control. We just submit to however he brings death. And we're ready to go whenever it is his will. My times are in his hands and precious in the sight of the Lord as the death of his saints. Praise be to God, Chandler White went to be with Jesus this week. Not just meat and herbs, but everything. Paul says, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, in order that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. I'm just going to close out. Verse 8, if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. How can someone living and someone dying give glory to God? And the answer is Jesus. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. So if I get life, it's Christ. And to die is gain. And and, and the way death is gain and puts him on display is that I show the world I'm, I'm, I'm not holding to what I'm leaving. I, all I want to do is go to him because it's gain. And so we can glorify Christ by making everything in life him. And in death, I leave everything behind gladly because what I have in Christ. That's what happens when he gets a hold of a heart. Aren't you glad he didn't just say, don't eat meat? There's something bigger at stake like God's glory and his lordship. So let's lead one another to these truths and live as holy as it is possible for men and women this side of glory. And just my concluding thoughts. Paul doesn't say lighten up these convictions. He says stand in awe of the risen Christ. He came into this world. He took our sins upon himself on a cross and he braced himself And he bore the full wrath of God for your sins on that tree. He bore the curse for you in his body. The just one hung on a cross for the unjust ones, us. And as he dies, he says, it's finished. Salvation is accomplished and he's buried and raised. And the one who believes in him is justified. You're declared not guilty before God. Your sins are washed away. They're made for, they were scarlet. Now they're white as snow. And God says, I remember him no more. Let that sink in. Now he can take a people to himself and Jesus will sanctify her. And now we love him and we keep days and we don't keep days and we eat meat and we don't eat meat. We drink and we don't drink for him. That's the law of Christ. Everything within me now lives for Christ. And then maybe secondly is now repentance and seeking Christ to grow because I am so prone to judge and to look down. I love making mountains out of ethical molehills. To love our convictions more than people is so broken. My pro- I got opinions on everything. Just ask me. God, make me loving. Make me loving to the people of God in this area. And, and I just got a simple question to go to the heart. 
let's say someone comes and says, hey, what's your conviction about handguns? Four hours. You got to get the right magnum. You got to, you know, boom, boom, boom. And I watch it. And I'm like, you really love guns. And I don't have a problem with, I'm not that kind of guy. But what if someone comes up and says, what's your view on the atonement? Oh, I believe he died for the elect. And that's it. Handguns and the atonement. Four hours, your joy gets raised, and the atonement is, yeah, I, I think this. Something's wrong. What fills our heart is all that thrills my soul is Jesus. Just poke me. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the next hour. Let it fill your heart. We've been bought with a great price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies and your freedoms. And receive one another as we all seek to live for Jesus and his glory. To God be the glory in the church. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this teaching. We thank you for the big guns that Paul pulls out to look at these little ethical molehills. God, I thank you that they're so big and they're so important. And I pray, set us free as a church to love one another in these areas. Help us to labor in each other's lives to have the right motives for everything that we do. And help us to receive and love one another with these differences in Christian liberty. God, let us love consciences that differ, but that are doing it for your name's sake. God, I enjoy that more than, than having the same conviction. God, work in our hearts and our lives and let us receive one another. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.